vogue in literature and culture conducted by the department of english sb college in mashhadi today we have the fifth lecture of the series given by dr abhinav nanda assistant professor department of humanities and social science at indian institute of technology on the topic ethics and historiographic metafiction research possibilities so before we begin let's take a moment of silence thank you this is sadia sabu joined by co-host sneha george who will be reading out the guidelines of the program good afternoon everyone these are a few instructions which are to be kept in mind for the smooth functioning of the program all the questions that are intended for the q and a session are to be posted addressing it to the everyone in the chat when the chat box are opened a feedback form will be posted in the end of the webinar in the chat box of both zoom and youtube platforms e certificates will be issued for participants who attend the program participants are rem reminded to accurately fill the feedback form to ensure that they get the certificates since all personal information are entered in the feedback forms participants are requested not to introduce themselves in the chat box as this might distract the speaker that is all by the way of instructions over to you satya i now invite mr anish ki joseph assistant professor sb college in nashiri to introduce the speaker thank you satya good afternoon everyone uh, welcome to the fifth webinar in the international webinar series on story storytelling methods organized by the department of english saint bertman's college chennai the speaker of the day as announced is dr abarna nanda and she is to speak on ethics and historiographic metafiction research possibilities uh it is my proud privilege and happiness to uh introduce and welcome dr abarna who is my good friend and former former classmate Uh, she is as as uh, satya said she is currently working as assistant professor in the department of humanities and social sciences in the institute of technology ropo she is a recipient of uh, university gold medal for graduate and post graduate examinations conducted by pondicherry university in 2009 and 2011 when i was also studying there uh, she completed her phd from the department of humanities and social sciences in the institute of technology madras on the broad topic of postmodern fiction some of her current research interests include historiographic metafiction war novels peace narratives and post colonial fiction so on behalf of the department and the college i heartily welcome dr abarna nanda and all the esteemed participants to this webinar thank you thank you anish for your kind words of introduction and thank you sb college for having me so first of all let me take this opportunity to say that it's always a privilege to be speaking to young minds and to, to have this opportunity means a lot to me so without much ado i will go to the topic of today's uh, talk that is ethics and historiographic metafiction and the research possibilities that are inherent in this area but before we go on to the topic of ethics and historiographic metafiction and the research possibilities i would like to introduce the topic of ethics and the topic of historiographic metafiction to you so what is ethics now ethics is a very age old and prevalent topic that we have all at some point or the other studied bits and pieces of it aristotle has written about it hobbes has written about it hume has written about it so at point or the other we are always looking at ethics from different possibilities but for the sake of today's talk i am going to limit my discussion on ethics to one particular critic that is martha nussbaum martha nussbaum is an american philosopher and a faculty member in the university of chicago who has done extensive work on the idea of ethics 
and its relation to literature. So in one of her works titled Exactly and Responsibly, uh, A Defense of Ethical Criticism, which was published in the year 1998, she cites the idea propounded by Henry James in the preface to Golden Bowl. So in, in the preface to Golden Bowl, Henry James writes, art is nothing if not exemplary and care nothing if not active, meaning that art should lead the way, it should be ethical and care, acts of care, acts of concern, should be active, should be action-based. It should not be something theoretical. So as in the preface to Golden Bowl and many other works written by Henry James, he expresses the view that the novelist is an ethical and political being whose conduct as he puts things in prose in a certain way is a form of exemplary moral conduct expressing out of the soil of his sensibility, a projected morality. So here, Henry James is actually reflecting on the role of the novel. He's not someone who writes something and puts it out into the world. A novelist is not something we, you know, it's, it's not an easy job. He's an ethical being. He's a political being. He, he has a function in the society. He has a role in the society that we uh, live. And therefore, he's, he, Henry James is of the opinion that we need more novelists in our society because we call, they call our imaginations to more exacting demarcations, our emotions, to a more honest confrontation with ourselves and the real impact our conduct has on the lives of others. So Henry James here is saying, is, is detailing a little, little bit about the function of literature itself. He's saying that literature is like a mirror. When you read that, when you read something, you are mirroring, you are, you are it is like the work is calling you, calling you to reflect on your own character, on your own behavior, on your own imagination. So it is self-reflective. It, it reflects what you are on the outside. And it's a very honest reflection because you are not going and telling somebody. You are talking to yourself. And with your conversation with the book, with the dialogue that you're initiating, with the book that you are reading, this, this particular uh, you know, literature assumes a function, assumes an ethical function. He argues that when we follow the novelist as attentive readers, we ourselves engage in ethical conduct and are reading themselves become accessible ethical acts. Now, this is all what Henry James says. Now, this is a view that Martha Newsbaum, in many of her works defends. And she's not, she's not doing this in a very naive manner. The need for assess, asserting the ethical value of fiction is calling for the need of saying, you know, fiction should be ethical. And so should the criticism of fiction. But she does not hold this position naively. While she does assert the importance of ethical and political criticism, she does not look at it as a singular way of perceiving literature. She does acknowledge that literature has many functions. But she argues that the appeal to aesthetic detachment is not innocent of politics. To read Dickens in a detached way, this is her own example. She cites the example of Dickens. She says that to read Dickens in a detached way is to refuse this call to reflect. Dickens is calling you to reflect on the social conditions of that time. So you, by telling that this is not something that we, you know, I will take up only the structural aspect of criticism. I will look at only the structural aspect of literature. You are refusing the call that the author gives you. The author is calling out to you for a discussion and you're refusing that call. This is something that Martha Newsbaum says. It is like you're willing to reflect on old age and death, but not about the social condition of the poor and the racially oppressed. Sticking only with the structural aspect of criticism would be to permit reflection to enter one portion of one's life, but to exclude it from another. So, in a very veiled manner, uh, Martha Newsbaum is actually criticizing the structural turn of in, in literary criticism. So post the 1960s, we have all seen a very structural, post-structural turn in criticism. And Martha Newsbaum is, is telling, you know, look at, look at this. While structural criticism is important, while you have to uh, you have to uh, you know, uh, pay attention to all that look at ethical criticism also. Do not forget ethical criticism. Do not forget the role of ethics in, in literature. 
do not forget the role that ethics plays in literature. So this is something that Martha Nussbaum vehemently argues for. With this in mind, let me move on to the introduction of the next concept that I'm going to speak about. So that is historiographic metafiction. Now, historiographic metafiction is a subgenre of postmodern fiction. So it is, it is, a, it is, a, you know, it is, it is a branch of postmodern fiction itself. But in order to understand historiographic metafiction, we must first understand what is history, what is historiography, and then only we can move on to the concept of historiographic metafiction. So what is history? History is most popularly defined as a knowledge of the past. So it is, this is the most textbook definition that I can give you. But we could problematize this rather simplistic definition of history. Here, past is treated as a unilateral and monolithic entity. So for example, I know the um, history of the invention of the light bulb. I'm telling you that I know the invention of the light bulb. This is done by Edison. I, I'm most likely telling you that I know the process that Edison went through while he's, he's inventing the light bulb. But I do not know the uh, academic war that Edison had with Tesla and Tesla's contribution to Edison. George Orwell rightly points out that history is often written from the winner's point of view. You don't get to see the uh, one who failed, the perspective of history from the one who uh, failed or from a third person narrative or, or uh, someone who, is, who has been an onlooker or from the people who lived during that time. These are not versions of history that you have access to, you and I have access to. So history most likely is written from the winner's point of view. So the point is that history as, a, as an academic domain may not consider the sources of knowledge. The domain of history takes a more product oriented approach to knowledge. It does not take a process oriented approach. It is very, very focused on the product in itself. In order to problematize this view, let us investigate the nature of truth, the nature of knowledge with an example. Now, many of you might have heard this example. And this is the story of Puritan Bridge. If you've taken philosophy, maybe you would have, uh, you would have already uh, heard this example, but I'm telling you for the benefit of people who do not know this. This is the story of Puritan Bridge. It is also called Sophism 17. The story is also called Sophism 17. It is described by Jean, Jean Puritan, an influential 14th century French philosopher. This Puritan bridge is a self-referential paradox that problematizes the nature of truth in itself. This, so this, this story goes like this. So Socrates, an imaginary Socrates and an, and an imaginary Plato are the characters in this story. It's told by Jean Puritan. So Socrates wants to cross a river and comes to a bridge that is guarded by Plato. So both are philosophers, big thinkers, right? That is the point of the story. So Socrates wants to cross the bridge, Plato is, Plato is uh, guarding the bridge. Plato says, Socrates, if in the first proposition which you utter, you speak the truth, I will permit you to cross. But surely if you speak falsely, I shall throw you into the water. So you speak the truth, I am going to let you pass through the bridge. If you say anything false, I'm going to throw you into the river. So the challenge on uh, Socrates who wants to cross the bridge is to speak the truth. But what is the truth? Anything can be contested. Anything is true only uh, here and now. It is not universal truth. So no statement can be uttered as an absolute truth. So Socrates thinks, he's thinking, so Socrates being a philosopher understands the problem of truth. So he tricks Plato and says, you will throw me into the river. So now he, now Plato is in a, in a fix. So now Plato is in a, put in a very paradoxical situation. If Plato throws him into the water, the statement becomes true. If he doesn't, then, then the statement becomes false. So, so he is in a, he's a paradoxical situation. So the entire point of the story is to show you the contingency of truth. So this brings us to the paradoxical nature of truth, to the contingent nature of truth. What you believe to be true now could be false later. What you believe could be false could be true later. It, it is interchangeable and, or you could have multiple truths, two people, two perspectives, two truths, sometimes three truths. 
So perspective changes truths into falsehood and falsehood into truth, thereby highlighting there are multiple truths with reference to multiple perspectives. So even if today I say that it is daytime now, it is only true for half of the world, it is not true for the rest of the world. Truth is contingent. Truth is limited. It is local. It is temporal. It is not universal. So now this discussion brings us to the domain of historiography. Now this is the domain of historiography, problematizing the truth itself. So historiography is the study of the perspectives of history. It acknowledges multifaceted nature of history, knowledge, and truth. It highlights the process of construction of history, thereby taking a very process-oriented approach uh, to knowledge. So it is not looking at the product, that is the history, written history, very nice history. It is not the objective of historiography. Historiography investigates the process of construction of history. What are the discourses that go into the construction of uh, history? Are there, are there uh, uh, discourses? If so, what are these? And if you isolate these discourses, is the end result going to be the same? Now, these are all questions that historiography as a domain asks. So simply put, historiography is the history of history. So while we are talking about historiography, we have two very, very important historiographers. First one is E. H. Carr. E. H. Carr, in his book, What is History? reflects on the nature of history in itself. So he is talking about the nature of history. He's saying that he gives a very pertinent analogy there. He says that history is like fish on a fishmonger's lab. So fish is there, that is raw materials are there. What you make out of that fish, whatever dish you want to make out of the dish depends on the subjectivity of the historian. So it is saying that history is not facts. History is not the truth. History, you have raw materials, but however I want to write it, from whichever perspective I want to write it, the historian will uh, bring in his subjectivity or her subjectivity and uh, put forth the history that he or she wants to put forth. So it is acknowledging uh, the subjectivity of the historian in the construction of history, in the process of the construction of history itself. The second most important historiographer, historiographer is, is uh, Hayden White. Hayden White has written a book called Meta History. Meta means on, on history. So he is reflecting on history. And he's, he, he extends the argument of E.H. Carr. And he says that, look at, look at this uh, history. It is not empirical facts. It is not, it is not formulas. It is not written in such and such a manner. It is written in the form of narratives. And anything that is narrative is subjective. It is sifted through a perspective. If the minute perspective comes in, the, the, the truth or claim to veracity, claim to authenticity, claim to be the oh, sole and ultimate truth goes out. It becomes a truth. It becomes your truth. And therefore, history is not the ultimate truth. History is not the ultimate truth of the past. So this particular argument about historiography is reappropriated into the domain of literature by Linda Hutchin in the Poetics of Postmodernism, which was published in the year 1988. So in this particular work, Linda Hutchin is um, theorizing the subgenre of, of uh, postmodern fiction called historiographic metafiction. But more than that, she's defending the genre of postmodern fiction. Because many people said that postmodern fiction is ahistorical, it is apolitical, it is aethical, it does not take an ideology, it does not take a standpoint. Right. So Linda Hutchin counters this argument and says that look at this genre of historiographic metafiction. It subverts history, it looks at alternate history, it sifts histories through a perspective, it questions the fictionality of fiction itself. It looks at fiction and history differently. It is inherently political. It is inherently historical. It is inherently ethical. It questions, it raises questions about the past. It raises compl complicated questions. Look at this genre. This genre is very significant to do in the postmodern uh, fiction. And thereby she refutes the argument that postmodern fiction is ahistorical and apolitical and aethical. 
So with this in mind, what we are going to do is we are going to look at one particular historiographic uh, fiction and uh, metafiction, and we are going to analyze that, that particular historiographic metafiction um, that we're going to look at. Okay, so the book that we are going to discuss is Everything is Illuminated, written by Jonathan Safran Poa. So Everything is, Illumin Everything is Illuminated is the first novel by the American writer Jonathan Safran Poe, which was published in the year 2002. It was adapted into a film of the same name starring Elia Wood in, to, in 2005. Now, this book is about a fictionalized history of a real town which was wiped off during the World War II, real Jewish town which was wiped off, named Prussian Boat during the Nazi regime during the World War II. So the story has two narrative lines. One is the magical realistic portrayal of history of Prussian board. The other is about the quest of the eponymous hero. That is, hero was named after the author himself, uh, Jonathan Safran Foer, to find out uh, a woman named Augustine, who, was, who is assumed to have saved his grandfather, his Jewish grandfather, during the time of war. So this is the quest of a man coming all the way from America to find all the way from America to Ukraine to find a woman who's assumed to have saved his grandfather. So in order to facilitate your understanding for people who have not watched this movie or read this text, I will play the trailer of the movie. I'm gonna share the screen. Okay, if the sound is not audible, please tell, let me know. It's audible, ma'am. I haven't started it. Is it audible? Yes, ma'am. Your grandfather wanted you to have this photograph for your collection. Who is Augustine? Grandma? Jonathan is traveling halfway around the world. You my translator? Forgive my speaking of English, Jonathan. As I'm not so premium with him. To search for the woman who saved his grandfather in World War II. That's my grandfather, Safran. And this is Augustina? This is our driver. <laughs> Please, do not be distressed. This is only driver seeing eye, bitch. Wait, he's blind? No, only he thinks this. Father informs me you are writing a book about this trip. I'm, I'm not a writer, more of a collector. And what do you collect? Things, family things. In a world far from ordinary. It's nice. Make sure to secure the door when I'm gone. There are many dangerous people who want to take things from Americans and also kidnap them. Good night. In a place far from home. I'm a vegetarian. You're a what? I don't eat meat. Pork? No. Chickens? No. But what about the sausage? No meat. What is wrong with you? One man's quest for the truth. Why do you do this? Sometimes I'm afraid I'll forget. Is a... So as you have seen, this story tells the quest. Uh, it begins with a hero, the eponymous hero, who's named after the author himself. It actually is semi-autobiographical, which is why it is named after the hero, uh, uh, author himself. Uh, Jonathan Safran Foa, embarking on a quest to find the lady named Augustine, who's believed to have saved his grandfather during the World War. Now his guides, as you have seen, is an anti-Semitic, cranky old grandfather his deranged dog, and his over-enthusiastic grandson, whose ridiculous English, whose love for American popular culture and constant chapter makes every situation in this otherwise serious novel funny. So he is the one who makes this entire novel. If you see, it's a very comical novel. You don't see many Holocaust novels which, uh, which take the road of comedy. Uh, so this is one of them. Uh, if you get a chance, you can watch the movie or read the book. The guides are not very knowledgeable about the subject of finding the village that once was Russian road, and usually just scam the tourists by taking them on long journeys. But after hearing the compelling story of our hero, Jonathan Safran Foer, they decide to help Jonathan find Augustine. 
And after traveling through much of rural Ukraine, they finally find Lista, the sister of Agassi. Uh, the meeting with Lista, you think that will throw light on Jonathan and uh, will have a moment with Jonathan. But what this meeting does is the unexpected twist of the novel. Uh, so it's a spoiler alert. So the meeting with Lista traumatizes the grandfather of Alex, the tour guide that you saw. And we discover one of the photographs of Alex's grandfather among Lista's collections. So this reveals that our grandfather in the story has lived in this particular section of the town. And that he, he has a past here that he does not speak about, that he, he's, he does not reveal to his own family or anyone for that matter. So late in the chapter, in the penultimate chapter titled Illumination, the grandfather reveals the painful truth of him betraying a close Jewish friend in one of the Nazi raids in Ukraine. And this, this is a section that brings out an entirely different perspective of Holocaust that you have read about in many other sections. So in order to give you an idea, I would like to read out those sections. So I'll share the book and I will read out highlighted sections of the um, text. Okay, so this is the point where uh, the, the grandfather in the story comes clear, says that I have a history here. I have a history in this particular uh, town and I have done an unspeakable crime. I have betrayed one of my friends in the Nazi raid. And he is telling his own past. He's revealing his own past to his grandson, Alex. I will tell you, Jonathan. So this is written by uh, written by uh, Alex as a letter to Jonathan later on in the text. I will tell you, Jonathan, that at this place, that at this place in the conversation, it was no longer Alex and Alex, grandfather and grandson talking. We yielded to be two different people, two people who could view one another in the eyes and utter things that are not uttered. When I listened to him, I did not listen to grandfather, but to someone else someone I had never encountered before, but whom I knew better than grandfather. And the person who was listening to the person was not me, but someone else, someone I had never been before, but whom I knew better than myself. So he is talking about a strangeness in the connection. In, before, when they used to talk, they used to talk as grandfather and grandson. They never talked as strangers. This was like a new self of the grandson and a new self of the grandfather is talking about a subject that has never been uttered before, that has never been discussed yet. So tell me more. So now uh, Alex is asking uh, his grandfather, tell me more. Tell me about your life in Prussian Road. Tell me about your past life that you have not disclosed to me. More, Herschel, he says. So this is the name of the Jew uh, that, uh, our grandfather has betrayed. Okay, so tell me more, I said. Herschel, it was as if he was our family. Tell me what happened, what happened to him? To him, to him and me, it happened to everybody. Do not make a mistake. Do not make any mistakes. Just because I was not a Jew, it does not mean that it did not happen to me. What is it? You had to choose and hope to choose a smaller evil. Now, this is one of the most popular lines from this particular text. Just because I'm not a Jew, it, it, you don't think that it did not happen to me. I had to choose a smaller evil. So this, this actually gives brings in a whole new perspective. You always speak about the trauma of the victim. You, tra you talk, uh, we talk a lot about trauma of the victim, but you don't talk about the trauma instigated uh, or, uh, you know, trauma felt by the perpetrator while a perpetrator is acting under the influence of structural violence. So this, in, in one of the Nazi raids, everyone is rounded up. Everyone in a village is asked to come out and everyone is asked to point fingers at a Jew at the nearest Jew in order to you know, take away the Jews. So in this particular raid, the grand, 
it, there comes a point where there is nobody else but grandfather's friend, Herschel, as a Jew in the group. So if he does not point, then somebody else would point to him. And then everyone would be killed. So in order to protect his family, in order to protect his wife, in order to protect his son, the grandfather in the story is pointing a finger at that Jew near to him, who is a very dear friend of the grandfather himself. So he's making a choice. Is it family or is it a friend? And he's making the choice uh, that I want my family to live. I want my son to live. I want my wife to live. So just because he made the choice and just because of that, uh, it does not it does not mean that he's not guilty. He has lived with this guilt and he has lived with this trauma. He has carried this trauma through generations. The war has ended. The world has become a better place. Uh, and a lot of things has happened. But even till date, the grandfather in the story is unable to reconcile with the trauma that he, uh, of the act, of that particular act he did many, many, many years ago. And this this is a very poignant uh, place in the story. And then another thing that I want to uh, talk about is, um, you know, uh, so why is not? So uh, uh, after that, uh, his grandson asks, but why did you leave the village? Why did you, why couldn't you stay in that village and carry on in that village? And he, it's a very interesting answer. I want to show you that answer. So why did you leave? This is asked by uh, his own grandson, Alex. Because I did not want your, your father to grow up so close to death. I did not want him to know of it or live with it. This is why I never informed him of what occurred. I wanted so much for him to live a good life without death, without choices, without shame. But I was not a good father, I must inform you. I was the worst father. I desired to remove him from everything that was bad, but instead I gave him badness upon badness. A father is always responsible for how his son is. You must understand. So he says, I, I, want, I relocated, I went to a different place, I went to a different place, I started a new life, I, I assumed a new name, I, I erased my history, I erased my personal history, because I did not want my son to, to, to grow up close to death, I did not want my son to know the version of the person I was. I did not want my son to know the betrayal that I did. But now in retrospect, when I look back at uh, raising my son, when I've had my grown up grandchildren, I think that I should have shared who I was in order for him to realize that his life, he owes his life to the death of Herschel, that he is alive because, because of that particular act that I did and that he would work to reconcile, he would work to recuperate the damage that is done in history. But I, I stripped him of his own personal history. I stripped him of, of all the knowledge of history, of that personal history. And that is why we do not have reconciliation. We do not have acts of uh, you know, asking forgiveness. We do not have any such acts because my son is ignorant of the history that I, that I am privy to, that I was witness to, that I was a participant of. Now, I would like to read out the section just after betraying her shell, what does uh, grandfather, you know, the emotions of, of grandfather and how it is narrated. So this is just after he's narrating, sorry, this is narrating the past. I'm sorry. Okay, so I looked at grandmother and she kissed me on the forehead. I kissed her on the mouth. Now this is, actually written like this. There is no spaces in between. 
So the author has purposefully to show the intensity of that action, to show uh, the intensity of the feeling that our uh, character is feeling. She, they have escaped death, even though they have done a very cruel act. They have escaped death. They have saved the family. So she kissed me on the forehead. I kissed her on the mouth and our tears mixed uh, on our lips. And then I kissed your father many times. I secured him from grand, grandmother's arms and I held him with so much force, so much that he started crying. I said, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. With every I love you, do you see the space is getting removed? It shows the intensity of the love he's feel, feeling for his son and the intensity of, of relief that he's feeling that his son, his son is not killed, that his son has escaped. And I knew that I had to change everything, to leave everything behind. And I knew that I could never allow him to learn of who I was and what I did because it was for him that I did what I did. It was for him that I pointed and for him that Herschel was murdered and that I murdered Herschel. And this is why he's how he is. He is how he is because a father is always responsible for his son. And I am, I, and I am responsible, not for Herschel, but for my son, because I held him with so much force that he cried because I loved him so much that I made love impossible. And I'm sorry for you and sorry for you. And it is you who must forgive. Me, he said these things to us. And Jonathan, where do we go now? What do we do with what we know? Grandfather said that I am. I, but this could not be true. The truth is that I also pointed at Herschel and I also said he's a Jew. And I will tell you that you also pointed at Herschel and you also said he's a Jew. And more than that, grandfather also pointed at me and said he's a Jew. And you also pointed at him and said he's a Jew. And your grandmother and little Igor, and we all pointed at each other. So what is it that he should have done? He would have been a fool to do anything else. But is it forgivable? what he did, can he ever be forgiven for, for his finger, for what his finger did and for, 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 he, for what he pointed to and did not point to, for what he touched in his life and what he did not touch. He's still guilty. I am, I am, am I? And now he said, we must make sleep. So in this section, he's actually addressing a very pertinent question. He's acknowledging the incident that happened. Grandfather is acknowledging an incident that happened. But since it is written in a letter by Alex, Alex is discussing the way forward. Now, three generations have passed. I have been in the dark about things that I, I did not know about all these things. But can you forgive grandfather for what he did? Do you understand this act? This is also an act of love. He loved his family. Can you understand and forgive him? Can we have reconciliation? Can we have uh, you know, an understanding? Can we move forward? Can I do something to, you know, to, for you to understand this, this particular pain that we are going through, the guilt that we are going through? What is the way forward? So this is a question that this, uh, this text particularly asks. It is not about the past alone. It is about the future also. Why we are discussing the past, we are also discussing the future. Now I'll uh, discuss the final version. And with that, I will try and wind up my talk. So uh, after this, they are discussing in their family, they have discussed the history that uh, grandfather has done. And the father is very angry. And Sasha is Alex, it is uh, his home name. So, is, uh, so he fights with his father. He says, no, I will assume all responsibility for the family. If you want to do something, you can go. So it is at this point, this is the final letter that grandfather writes to Jonathan himself. And final letter with which the grandfather commits suicide. So I spoke with Sasha tonight after his father left. And I told him that I was proud of him. I told him that I had never been so proud or so certain of who he was. But father is your son, he said, and he is my father. I said, you're a good man and you have done good things. So this is a conversation between grandfather and Alex. I put my hand on his cheek and remembered when my cheek was like this, like his cheek. 
I said his name, Alex, which, was, which had also been my name for 40 years. I will toil at heritage touring, he said. I, I will fill father's absence. No, the grandfather is telling, no, you do not do anything such as that, I told him. It is a good job, he said, and I can make enough money to care for mother and little Igor and you. No, I said, make your own life. That's how you can best care for us. I put him to bed, which I have not done for him since he was a child. I covered him in blankets and combed his hair with his hand. Try to live so that you can always tell the truth, I said. I will, he said, and I believed in him, and that was enough. Then I went to Iggy's room, and he was already sleeping, but I kissed him on his forehead, and I said a blessing to him. I prayed in silence that he should be strong and no goodness, and never know evil and never know war. And I came here to the television room to write you this letter. All is for Sasha and Iggy, Jonathan. Do you understand? I would give everything for them to live without violence. Peace. That is all that I would ever want for them. Not money, not even love. It is, it is still possible. I know that now. And it is the cause of so much happiness in me. They must begin again. They must cut all the strings, yes, with you, with their father, with everything they have known. Sasha has started it. And now I must finish it. Everyone in the house is in bed but me. I'm writing this in the luminance of the television. And I'm, I'm so sorry if this is now difficult to read, Sasha, but my hand is shaking so much. And it is not out of weakness that I will go to the bath when I am sure that you are asleep. And it is not because I cannot endure. Do you understand? So he he is already initiated his suicide. He has, he has cut his vein and he goes to the bath later on in, in the story. So he's saying, this is not weakness, but I want to end the history here. I want to end, and I want to pay way for reconciliation. And it is not because I cannot endure. Do you understand? I am complete with happiness. It is what I must do and what I will do. And I will do it. Do you understand me? I will walk without noise. I will open the door in darkness and I will. And the text ends here. So that is the concluding uh, section of, of the story. Everything is illuminated. So this text actually raises so many questions. It raises uh, the question of, of the way forward. What, what, you know, so you have discussed history, you have discussed the complicated nature of history, all that is fine. But how do we pay way for reconciliation? How do we pay way for uh, what is going to come next? What are we going to do? How can we initiate a, de a debate about what's next? How can we reconcile? So with this, I will try and bind up the... So this is the research possibility of a historiographic metafiction. Historiographic metafiction raises questions. It is a, it is a, it is a domain that merges three, um, three, three varied domains. One is history, another is theory, another is literature. So it is a combination of these three domains that we are talking about in the genre of historiographic metafiction. And with this, I will try and wind up this talk. So writing this novel is an attempt at sensitizing the reader to the truth of violence. It is a political response and a testimony to the importance of art that engages with history and ethics in the face of power. The novel also speaks of the significance of acts of love, acceptance, and concern as a means of resolution, a resolution of conflict and of reconciliation. So he says that violence is not a very sustainable way of moving forward. It is in acts of concern, love, kindness, that you find a sustainable uh, method of reconciliation. So with this, I end my talk. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for a wonderful lecture. Now we'll be moving on to the question answer session. For the smooth conduct of the session, Nina and I'll be reading out selected questions from the chat box. The first question is from Elsa Lalu. Histographic mystification. Sneha, one, Sneha, one second. Could I maybe uh, have a small chat with Dr. Aparna? Sure. All right. So thank you so much, Aparna. This is Vimal here. And thank you so much for the talk.
and we have quite uh, if you if you looking if you following your chat you'll see that you have quite some comments and questions in the chat and i think they'll be read out to you soon so if you'll pardon my liberty i was thinking maybe i could have a quick word with you a uh, small chat before we go on to the questions directly sir fine yes please all right so um, so you began with this incitement by henry james that you know art should be ethical and that it should perhaps encourage exemplary moral conduct Hmm. um but this question of being ethical but this question of being politically correct because that's apparently a term that is very fashionable so being ethical or being politically correct is 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 just a factor of the positions that you take because somebody who is conservative minded uh, as opposed to somebody who is extremely radical in his outlook can have different takes on what is politically correct and what is ethical and so on so the power of postmodern thought and philosophy is that it often complicates this easy understanding of moral positions uh, mm. about what constitutes the ethical all right mm. or indeed any sort of reliance on any kind of certainty okay, and fixity uh, dr vimal why do you come complicate ethical with uh, political correctness because uh, because of this because of this reason because it's a factor of the positions that you take what is ethical to you may not seem ethical to me yes there are varied ethics no as i told you in the beginning itself there is ethics from the perspective of hobbes there is ethics from the perspective of aristotle there is ethics from zizek and there is ethics from levinas so each of these ethical standpoints are very different and ethics has moved away from the perspective of political correctness from the perspective of binary to a very larger spectrum and we have acknowledged it in the postmodern ethical discussions Hmm. but when you say that you know, art has this function to be ethical you are we assign some sense assigning a function to art and so even the need to be exemplary or the need to be moral doesn't it corrupt the idea of the purpose of art itself that i already uh, discussed in my talk i said that this is one of the functions and uh, um, uh, martha newsbaum does not assume this function naively she says that this is one of the functions of art and a very pertinent function and she is criticizing it in a context in the context of the structural turn which postmodern post structuralism has taken and she is resuming the uh, criticism uh, the ethical criticism or the the criticism that happened before the post structuralist turn or even the structuralist turn and she is resuming and saying this is also important look at it i never said that this is the sole function of art all right then so thank you so much i guess we can move on to the questions now Okay, ma'am. Shall we start with the first question? Yes. Yeah. Okay. The first question is from Elsa Lalu. The question is: Historiographic metafiction is used in many fictions combined with magical realism, like in Hundred Years of Solitude. This feature comes under postmodernism. Ma'am, what is your opinion about treating metafiction as a Western idea? Do Indian epics have magical realism, or is it just fantasy? Salman Rushdie's Midnight's Children, magical realism. No, so we have actually used magical realism, but I do concede with the idea that Indian fiction has not uh, ex has not used postmodern narrative techniques as much as Western uh, Western writers have used it, and. Uh, that that i really agree and uh, this is something that we should discuss about in the future and this is a uh, this is a scope for future discussion so uh, even in uh, our you know you have salman rushdie you have amitav ghosh you have arundhati roy arundhati roy's book also is very written in a very postmodern way it, it may not be magical realism but it is it is postmodern narrative so if you look at if you keep all these popular writers aside we don't have many writers who write in local language uh, or at least i am not very familiar with the uh, local literature so postmodern realism is restricted that even linda hutchin who theorizes postmodern uh, fiction says that she says that this is a this is predominantly a western genre uh, and uh, she she actually acknowledges that that aspect and uh, i think we should have a discussion in the future based on this yes indian literature not many literature literary works are there i mean magical realism using magical realism and that technique of postmodern narrative yes thank you ma'am i read to you I... 
Am I audible, ma'am? Uh, yes, Nina, you are audible. Okay, thank you. Uh, ma'am, our next question is from Surya Sugadhan. Ma'am, running in the family can be also analyzed the same way under the light of histographic metaphysics, right? Also, how magic realism can be associated with histographic metaphysics? Ma'am, there's a second part to this question. Also, photographies, cartography, the features of postmodern fiction. How can we associate those with histographic metaphysics? Okay, so this question has two two uh, sections. So any any text can be seen through any theoretical lens. I do not uh, subscribe to the view that a theoretical lens is a watertight compartment. It is not a watertight compartment. You can look at a postmodern text through a structural lens. You can look at a structure uh, that structuralism text through a postmodern lens. It is not something that is exclusive. in fact they are they are all in a spectrum if you look at uh, uh, the um, history of uh, what is this literary theory one is a reaction to the other so there is an action there is a reaction there is an action there is a reaction and it is post structuralism that actually says you know everything has a center so you are just changing the center and then finally you are coming to this particular point that is disrupt the center itself and even even after 50 years 60 years of Uh, discussion on that we still go back to our centers so this particular discussion on theory has always been to and fro to and fro they are not what a type of compartments one has an overlap on the other so any text for that matter can be looked at through the theoretical lens that you take a theory is like um, i always tell my students theory is like a lens so you are sitting somewhere and you're looking out of your window if your window is pink color what you see outside the window will be pink if your window is you know glass pure glass then in that case you will have a clear vision if you have a yellow lens you will see it in a yellow uh, color so the theory that you take is very much like the lens through which you look at it you want to be informed by that lens which is why you're looking at it uh, you are looking at that particular um, theory um, you are analyzing the text through that particular theory so you can look at it anyway so that is the first answer the second thing is photography you are talking about photography even in jonathan safran foer's everything is illuminated there is one article that addresses photography and its relation to memory and that is been associated with postmodern fiction so the aspect of postmodern fiction memory and photography and how uh, photography you know changes or um, um how photography enables your memory and forgetting the philosophy of memory and forgetting is something that has already been discussed you can go back and look at it uh, this is a very interesting thought and uh, this is one of the upcoming research areas in uh, in this particular arena that i am talking about thank you Okay, ma'am. The next question is from Dr. Pranav Patroshi. Uh, he has asked you to name some novels on metafiction and some books on metafiction theory. Metafiction or historiographic metafiction? Uh, he has asked metafiction, ma'am. So Italo Calvinos, you can start with Italo Calvinos. Uh, Once upon a time, a traveler. So metafiction is nothing but. self reflexive fiction so you are saying once upon a time a traveler and then you are saying oh, but this is just a story why are you bothered so this is a reflexive you are not allowing your audience to have this willing suspension of disbelief right so this this is something that meta fiction this is a function of meta fiction you can start your reading with italo calvino and you can take it forward from there if you want historiographic meta fiction uh, one of my favorite uh metafiction that addresses history also is uh, michael andash's divisadro divisadro is a typical example of metafiction and a, a very pertinent example of historiographic metafiction you can start your reading from there so that uh, would be an excellent choice and um i think it is patricia vo 
who has written the theory for metafiction. So if you want to read a theoretical text, you can read Patricia Vogue. Thank okay, you. thank you, ma'am. Our next question is from Deepti Mohan. Ma'am, can we consider memoirs written with historical incidents as background as historiographical fiction? Uh, it's not clear to me. Could you please repeat the question? Ma'am, can we consider memoirs written with histo historical incidents as background as historiographical fiction? Okay, so memoirs who has been which has been written with uh, historical fiction in the background uh, can we consider it as historiographic fiction? Now, historiographic fiction is uh, uh, again something that uh, uh, I have been working on for a very long time. Yeah, and I've been I've been in the attempt of theorizing historiographic fiction, that is Commonwealth historiographic fiction. But at some point, you realize that every fiction is uh, is reflexive. At some point, there is an unintentional uh, reflexivity. You look at any fiction, it becomes historiographic metafiction. It comes under the category, larger category of historiographic metafiction. So I'm not very sure of the category that you're suggesting as historiographic fiction, but yes. Uh, memoirs with history uh, depicted in the background can be read through the lens of historiographic metafiction. Yes. Ma'am, the next question is from uh, Rashmi. Bug uh, Rashmi. Uh, the question is, how far, how far do you think oral narratives can be an inherent part of metafiction? Okay, oral narratives and metafiction. Uh, so this is a this is an area that I have not worked on. To be very truthful, oral narratives and uh, uh, this is a very interesting topic. Uh, the concept of oral narratives. But one of the most important things that you have to notice about oral narratives is the fluidity of oral narratives itself. So one version is very different from the other. So you cannot pin down a particular version and say that this is the version I am going to talk about. It is very fluid. So if I say a particular uh, story, it will be uh, in one version. If, if I tell my daughter the same version of the story, what she tells will be a different version. There is that very famous Chinese secret, right? So you tell, 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 the same story goes on, goes around and by the end, it will be a very different story. So oral narratives has this uh, very beautiful uh, nature of being fluid. So because of its fluid nature, I don't know whether uh, this, this kind of metafiction and these postmodern categories would be, uh, would be appropriate for, uh, for analyzing uh, oral literature. I have not worked on oral literature. Maybe you can ask a more informed person about oral narratives. I'm not, a, I'm not a very well-versed in oral narratives. Thank you, ma'am. Our next question is from Vipin Cheryan. How do you consider the use of the generic figure of the collector in postmodern works like the novel Everything is Illuminated or John Fowler's, Fowler's Collector? I find it fascinating how the troupe works as a constant acceptance and rejection of past. Your comments? Okay, so you're saying the role of the collector, the one who goes about and collects things, is, is uh, someone who accepts the past, at the same time he's rejecting uh, the past. Uh, so, yes, as I already said, this is a field that is upcoming. Uh, you could read the work written by Paul Ricoeur on memory and forgetting. If this particular work actually addresses questions about memory uh, and uh, this, this collecting things, photographs and things like that. So this would actually, this is a very ongoing debate in, the, in, this, particular, um, in this particular area, in this particular domain. So the, I, I'm not sure if I can give a simple answer to that. Yes, uh, but it should be problematized. It is both a rejection and it's both an acceptance, but this uh, acceptance also should be problematized. This rejection should also be problematized. Uh, 
Thank you, ma'am. The next question is from Shiji Mariam. Can post-truth be associated with the understanding of historiographic metafiction? It's not clear to me. Can what to be associated? Post-truth. Can post-truth post be? Yeah. Yes. Yes. This everything post uh, uh, talks about fluidity, talks about non-linearity. So post uh, metafiction also talks about non-linearity. So there is a connection there. But as I already said, it is not the connection. It is not making the connection that is significant. It is problematizing the connection that is significant. So you can make the connection, but you need to problematize how you look at post-truth, how you look at uh, this genre of historiographic metafiction or metafiction in itself. And then you need to find a middle ground and then connect it. So generally, I always tell my students when I teach uh, uh, criticism, it is how you look at the text. If there is a text, text can be anything. It can be movie, it can be a song, it can be anything. Um, so it is not that you connect, you take a theory and you apply it on the text. It is how you perceive that theory, how you perceive the text and how you sift that text or a number of texts through, uh, through a perspective that is very significant. Yes, you can do that. Post-truth and post-modernism goes very well in hand in hand. Thank you, ma'am. Our next question from Dr. Rukmini S. Where does Indian literature stand in, stand in hyper-reality in post-modernism? Indian literature and hyper-reality. Where does Indian literature stand in hyper-reality in post-modernism? Okay. So, um, again, uh, my work has significantly addressed Commonwealth literature, but I have not studied Indian literature in great detail. So, uh, if you talk about hyper-reality, I can suggest a Sadie Smith. Sadie Smith's work actually addresses the concept of hyper-reality and uh, things like that. But Indian literature... Uh, per se, even if you say there are examples of hyperreality, I am not sure if uh, postmodernism, in its full uh, swing, has come to um, has come fully to India. And this could also be uh, because of our histories, because of the way in which we look at our histories, because of our colonial history. We look at our history in a our history of nationalism and the things like that in a positive light. But if you look at, um, for example, if you look at this particular text, Nazi, World War, uh, all those uh, countries that were engaged in World War, their perspective of nationalism is very different from the way we look at uh, nationalism. And it is because our perception of history is different that uh, we, we adopt different strategies to our literatures. So literature is nothing but a reflection of our society itself, 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 no. So the societal function, the way it hides, this we will definitely have to go back and we will have to read Wuthering Heights again and then look at, uh, uh, that look at uh, the history in Wuthering Heights. So I don't think I can say this right now, but there might be articles. You can look at uh, articles that has addressed history in Wuthering Heights. Even if you don't search for historiographic metafiction, because Wuthering Heights was written at a very different uh, era. Not it was not written with the knowledge of history. It was not written with the sorry. It was not written with the knowledge of theory, theoretical understanding. It was written as fiction. It was a it is a linear fiction. So you can perhaps look at it or you can write to me and then we can have a discussion later. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Our next question is from Virendra Yadav BM. Can you study the Indian novel from the Western point of view without Indian ethics? Can we study the? Can we study the Indian novel from the Western ethical point of view without Indian ethics? 
without the theoretical framework of ethics it would always if you studying indian works i would always suggest that you look at indian uh, theoreticians also it is not that you should look at only at uh, i do not subscribe to the view that you should look at western theoreticians alone you should look at indian theoreticians you can take the framework of the west but you should modify the framework of the west while we are looking at indian uh, literature this is something that uh, i i feel yes thank you ma'am we have now Ma come to the end of the q and a session uh, we thank you thank all participants for all those wonderful questions uh, as we have now come to the end of the program i would like to invite dr vimal mohan john assistant professor of st berkman's college to propose the word of thanks uh, thank you sneha um, i suspect an orchestration here in having myself and professor anish take up the present task of introducing as well as saying thanks to uh, professor aparna and i say this because we both had the pleasure of studying alongside to sananda uh, we were colleagues for a good 3 years while we were researchers uh, working on our phd's and we had some really good times then and i'm so happy to reassociate with her albeit over this virtual platform um so i'm so happy and grateful that she took up our proposal and gave us this talk on uh, modernism postmodernism and ethics uh, a seemingly set of uh, positions a difficult set of positions to reconcile so uh, on behalf of the department of english at sb college and all our participants both on zoom and over youtube i offer you our collective appreciation and thanks prof nanda thank you so much for your time and for your words um and we we hope you will also come down to sb for a less virtual association <laughs> when when this new normal kind of goes back to the regular normal thank and you so much dr vimal I look forward to meeting you guys on yeah, a virtual platform. Yes, please, please consider this an invite to come down. Yeah. Uh, my my gratitude. Um, are you saying something, sir? Are oh, you finished? Then so uh, my gratitude and thanks also to the HOD who you see now on our screen, uh, Professor P J Thomas, uh, and to the convenience of this series, Professors Anish and Professor Nitin Vergis. um and also to our wonderful hosts uh, our students and indeed everyone who has contributed towards the fruition of the series of lectures uh and lastly a big thank you to our participants over zoom and youtube um your response your participation is the biggest fuel that we need to propel ourselves forward thank you all and do join us for the next talk where professor nicole deverain will talk about british new wave science fiction and representations of africa It Thank would you. be my pleasure. Thomas, sir, yeah, okay. you want? To, yeah. Go ahead. Yes. No, I'm done. You were about to say something, I guess. I just want to say thank you to Professor Nanda. It was a good lecture, and I really enjoyed. I could not participate in this Q and A. So you're reading that you know metafiction is historically is very refreshing. That we cannot avoid history. That history is inevitable, and it is there in some form of some form or some form or other in fiction is a wonderful reading you have redeemed metafiction from the cliche of being a historical or a political and so on so thanks for the talk thank you very much thank you very much sir it was my pleasure being a part of your lecture series i look forward to meeting you in person thank you very much thank you ma'am and thank you sir Thus, we have now come to the end of today's session. We hope you have enjoyed and benefited from these deliberations. We hope to meet you all on second September at four thirty p.m. for the sixth lecture of the series. Under then, goodbye.